dwells right where you are. He lives on the inside of you. And I pray that all of you are excited this morning. I pray that you had a strong week, a strong week in the Lord. A strong week being a week where I fought to live the word. I fought to obey the word. I fought to be just like my father in heaven. I fought on this journey and I fought a good fight. And now we come together to celebrate. We come together to lift him up. We come together to give God thanks for bringing us through and guiding us through another week. Our God is so good. He is so wonderful so powerful and so strong. And so as we do every week, I want you now to stand to your feet. I want you standing right now, and I want you standing in your heart and in your mind and standing physically as we prepare to enter into the presence of the Lord. As we prepare to say, God, we honor you, and we want to come closer to you. We want to be more like you. We want to mirror your image. And so that is what we're going to do. I want you to get those hands together, get ready to clap them. I want you to passionately worship, passionately praise the Lord. Let's give him everything that we have. Leave nothing behind. Let's give him everything that we have as we engage in worship. And so, Lord, our King, we magnify your great name. We come to you, Jesus, with with such joy. We come to you, God, with such excitement and with such passion, God. We come to you knowing that, Lord, you have carried us through another week. You have been there. You have ordered our steps. You have guided us. You have lifted us, Lord. You gave us wisdom. You gave us knowledge, God. You gave us understanding of who you are, Lord. And God, you gave us faith to be able to march another day, another week, to march in victory, to march strong, to march step by step, representing who you are. You have given us victory over the enemy. You've given us victory over death. You've given us victory over the grave. And you have given us victory over this pandemic time, God. We, your people, your believers, your children, we rise in victory. We praise from victory. We worship from victory, God. We are excited about you. And Lord, now I pray that you will fill every home, touch every worshiper, Everybody who gives their all to you this morning, God, fill them and bless them and lift them and strengthen them, God, and pour out your grace upon their lives. I pray that you will go into every child, every teenager, every woman, every man, every husband, every wife, God, and do your work, Lord. Do a marvelous work in our lives today. I speak life and joy and peace and strength. And to all those who are listening to us, all those who will come on the line, God, let them experience your grace and your power and your presence, Lord. Use this means of this Zoom, of this Facebook, of social media to impact our lives, God. You are so great and nothing can keep your word bound. Nothing can keep your presence bound. And so I pray for a lifting and I pray for a building and I pray for a strength to come from above into our hearts, into our mind, into our spirit. So that God, when we complete this day of service, we are nothing like we were when we entered in, but we're more like you, God, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, God. We are mirroring your image. So now, Lord, we put our hands together. Come on, everybody. Clap your hands. Let the sound of victory go in your home. Let the sound of victory be heard right where you are. We clap our hands. We lift our voices. We declare you are great. We declare you are mighty. Come on, everybody. Lift your voice with hallelujahs. Lift your voice with God, you are worthy. Lift your voice with there's nobody like you. Come on, let that go in your home. Let it go through your living room, through your kitchen, and through your bedroom. Let the praises fill your house. Raise your voice in praise. Clap those hands and let's get ready to sing with all of our power, with all of our might, and sing to the glory of the Lord this morning. Let's praise Him.
Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Come on, give him glory. Hallelujah. God, we honor you. We thank you for grace today. We thank you for new mercy, God. And we honor you. Hallelujah. Come on, help me lift up to him our worship to the Lord that he is so worthy of. God, we thank you for another day. We thank you for being so good. We thank you because there's none like you. You are high and lifted up, and we're going to give you our best praise and our best worship this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just thank him for grace. Grace, you gave me grace. Grace beyond measure. Grace with much favor. You gave me grace. Unlimited grace, I live for your glory, strength for my story, unmerited grace. Hallelujah, God, we thank you for grace. Grace, you gave me grace, grace beyond measure, grace with much favor, unlimited grace. Limited grace, I live for your glory, strength for my story, unmerited grace. Hallelujah, thank you, Lord. I'd be lost. Oh, I would be lost without you. Not much more I could have gone through if it had not been. With much favor, you gave me grace, unlimited grace. I live for your glory, strength for my story, unmerited grace. Come on, lift it up to him again one more time. Just say grace. Grace, you gave me grace, grace beyond measure. Grace with much favor, you gave me grace, unlimited grace. I live for your glory, with strength for my story, unmerited grace. Come on, tell him one more time, I'd be lost. Oh, I would be lost without you, not much more. I could have gone through if it had not been for your grace. I wouldn't be here this very day. Oh, I would be lost without you. Not much more I could have gone through if it had not been. For your grace, I wouldn't be here this very day. Oh, I would be lost without you. Not much more I could have gone through if it had not been for your grace. I wouldn't be here this very day. You gave me grace, grace beyond measure, grace with much favor. You gave me grace, unlimited grace. I live for your glory, with strength for my story, unmerited grace. Hallelujah. Oh, grace, you gave me grace, grace beyond measure, grace with much favor. You gave me grace, unlimited grace. I live for your glory, with strength for my story, unmerited grace. 
Come on, thank God for his grace today. God, we thank you for your grace. Hallelujah, God. Unlimited, unmerited grace. Hallelujah. God, thank you for strength today. Strength for my story. Hallelujah. You're awesome, God. You're great, God. You're worthy, God. Oh, God, I love you today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's because of your grace that I have strength. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Strength like no other. Thank you, Lord. Woo! There's nobody like you. I honor you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You're worthy, God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes, I love you, Lord God. You are my strength. Thank you, Lord. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Reach out to me. You are my strength. Yes, God. Strength like no other. Strength like strength of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Wow, Hallelujah. truly God is our strength. And I know you you sense his presence now. The presence of the Lord brings strength. He brings power to our lives. And 
I want you to just worship him for what he is putting in you right now. Because when we tell him he is our strength, we begin to increase the capacity of our strength. Because the Lord always responds to our worship. And so God, you are our strength. You are our power. Thank you for authority. Thank you for might. And if you don't mind, what I would love for you to do right now, family, is you have the ability to chat in the chat box and I, we have the ability to pray. And what I want you to do right now is to use your chat and whatever you need strength for. I want you now to just type in that chat box, God, I thank you for strength to endure, strength to walk by faith, strength to forgive, strength to love. Whatever you need strength for, put the words, God, I thank you for the strength too. I know it's a lot of typing, but God, thank you for the strength too. And the reason we're saying thank you because that is what God is going to do. He's going to give you exactly what you need strength for as you type and as you put it in there, Lord. I thank you for strength, God, to worship, strength to praise, strength to fight, God. I thank you, Lord, for strength, God, to be able to, to be exactly who you called me to be. And I want you to engage that right now in, in your chat area because that gives me the opportunity when we're done, go and look at those chats and I'm going to pray and I'm going to thank God and I'm going to agree with you for that area where strength is needed. And we're going to believe God to just operate in us in his fullness. We're going to believe God to work with us. And, and I, I see that. I see that strength to lead in the time of confusion. I see that strength to, to endure in this season, strength for perseverance. I, I see that strength to be able to fight in holiness. That's what we're going to do, God. We're going to believe God all week for strength in these areas, strength to be consistent. Yes, that's what we need, strength to see others as you see them. I love that. That's, that's where we are. That's where we are going. God, I thank you for strength to continue to be obedient, to love, to worship, and to believe. God, thank you for strength for family unity, Lord. That's what we're going to believe, God. Strength to, for increased capacity. I love it. Increased capacity, God. That's what we need. Strength in that area. Thank you for strength, God, to, to let go and give you control of my life. That's what we're praying for. That's what we are agreeing for. Strength to trust you in all things, Lord. That's what we are worshiping and believing for. Strength for removing the pain in and, and, and God, remove that pain in my left shoulder for the ability to lift my hands and worship. God, I thank you. You are our healer. And I thank you for strength to heal that shoulder, to heal that arm, God, to heal that body. Because where you are, there is healing. Strength for the family, God. That's what we need. And we're believing you for strength for our family. Thank you for patience, God. That's what we are walking in. Strength in that area. And so you can keep them coming. And we're going to be agreeing all week for that because I believe we have a, a prayer answering God. And when we lift our petitions up to him and we believe, God will answer our prayers. So thank you. And, and you make sure you get yours in. And that's what we're going to do all week long. We will be in agreement. I'll be praying and I'll be believing God for each and every one of you that his strength will flow in you for those areas of need. Amen. Thank God for worship again. Thank him for our worship team and, and that being in my wife and, and each and every one of you who are singing along. And again with DeAndre on the keyboards, Skylar doing our technician stuff behind the scene. We, we have a team that God is using to bring about best that we can bring in this time and we are growing and we are developing and we are building nothing stops us from growing and that's exciting and this month we are focusing on the fear of the lord very 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 important topic again our children they are absorbing this fear of the lord thank you melina for teaching this morning 
our children are absorbing in the fear of the Lord. They're absorbing that topic. They're absorbing the teaching and, and they're rising up and they're going to live in this capacity. And so are we as we continue to look at this and, and fight to live in the fear of the Lord, to allow our lives to, to, to uh, rise up in this area and to live this in excellence. And I know last week we looked at is the last couple of weeks. I think this is the third Sunday. So the last couple of weeks, we looked at the life of Joseph and the fear of the Lord and how it impacted his life. And today we want to look into the life of Abraham and we want to see in his life the fear of the Lord and, and, and how it was revealed and how he walked in the fear of the Lord. And church and family, guess we are going to clothe ourselves in this attribute of God, we have to. It is, it is so critical. I, I think about it daily about this particular uh, area that we are training in, the fear of the Lord, and it is so critical to our journey. And so I, I want us to really, really, really open our ears and uh, allow our ears and our hearts and our spirits to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to each of us in this area. So Genesis chapter 22 in Genesis, I want to read for you verses 1 through 12 and verses 16 and 18. I'm going to read in Genesis and then we're going to unpack this and see what the Lord is saying in the area of the fear of the Lord in the life of Abraham. Genesis 22 verses 1 through 2, excuse me, 1 through 12. It says, New King James, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. It says in verse uh, 16 through 18. And he said, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing, I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice and, and go back to the other scripture that we, we have right i think um because i skipped something there oh there it is let me let me start at um at verse number six Oh, yeah, I skipped a whole, oh, I just missed the Bible. Uh, let, hey, watch it. All right, I'm going to go at verse 6. It says, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar, very important. He built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand 
and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Look at that verse 12. He said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And then in verse 16, he said, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. There, there we go. Again, I want to talk about the fear of the Lord in the life of Abraham and, and, and unpack these scriptures that we just read. When we started uh, the reading of the text, it said that after these things, God tested Abraham. These things that the Bible is referring to, these things, they refer to the incidents that happened, the activity that happened in the life of Abraham that prepared him for the test that God gave him. These things. I always pay attention when it says these things. That, that, is, that is very important. He says, after these things, God tested Abraham. These things that he was speaking of were the activities in the life of Abraham that what? That prepared him for the test that God was going to give him. Why? Because God, he never tests you and I in an area that he has not prepared us for. God is a God of preparation. And anytime you are taking a test, you're going through a test, you are experiencing a test, believers know that God prepared you for that test. He prepared you for that storm. He prepared you for that valley experience. He prepared you for that struggle or that difficulty because the Lord will never have you or I experience any test any storm, any challenge without first preparing us. And that's what you are going through right now, preparation for what is to come. God, we, that's why we always say God is busy. We, we, don't, we don't use that the devil is busy line. No, God is busy. God is busy right now preparing you for what is to come. He's getting you ready mentally, emotionally. He's getting you ready physically. God is getting you ready in your whole person to, to be able to pass the test that is before you. Because God is preparing me, that means I have no excuse that, that to not come through whatever I'm going through with victory. I don't have no excuse not to win where I am right now. Why? Because I'm prepared for this. And that's the mindset you have to have. That is the language you have to speak to your own ears. God, you prepared me for this because preparation has nothing to do with how you feel. Preparation has to do with what you know in the operation of God. God said you prepare whether you feel like it or not. You are prepared whether you don't think you're ready or not. God said, I prepared you. I was working on you through different incidences in your life to get you ready for where you are right now. And so all you have to do is say to yourself, I am prepared. And when you speak the language that I am prepared, that's kingdom language. That's not, that's not talking to myself in the natural as spirit language. I'm talking to myself and I'm declaring, I know I'm prepared because God got me ready for this. And we know, as Paul so told us in Corinthians, there has no temptation ever taken you, come upon you, 
that, that God has not already prepared you for. Nothing will come upon you that God hasn't prepared you for. God is faithful, who will not allow you or I to be tested, tempted, or go through anything without making sure we're ready to go through it. And so you are prepared for where you are right now. You can handle it and you can win. No more crying, no more softness, no more uh, feeling sorry for yourself. You are prepared to handle that situation you are facing right now. So after these things, the Bible says that God tested Abraham. And in preparation for the test, Abraham had to complete some assignments because again, just like in school, the teacher does not give you a test without previously giving you assignments to prepare for the test. That's why again, God is active in your life. You, you were given assignments this past week. God said, I gave you assignments to prepare you for the test to come. And for Abraham, there are a couple of major assignments that I want to bring out that he had to take. And one was called the assignment of the unknown. And the other was the assignment of uncertainty. The assignment of the unknown is when Abraham had to choose uh, between grabbing his family and all his belongings and going on a journey where he did not know where he was going or to stay where he was. That he had to choose. It's, it's called the, the, the assignment of the unknown. It's, it's an assignment where God leads you and directs you, but does not tell you where he's taking you. You just have to trust that God, I know it is you who are, you're speaking to me. It's, it's going not knowing is what we call it. And when you go not knowing, you go trusting. And that's what God wants from you and I. He doesn't want me going knowing everything about the journey and how it's going to work out, how it's going to happen. God said, no, when you go, you go trusting me. And that was the first uh, assignment Abraham had when God told him, to get your family, and I want you to go to a place where I will show you. You, you don't know now. You just trust me step by step. And, and, and what a way to live, a life of living, God. I'm my, my very life is dependent upon you showing me where to go, you giving me direction, God. I am waiting to hear from you to show me which way to go. And so his first assignment was the assignment of the unknown. Uh, the, the next assignment was the assignment of uncertainty. And that's where he had to choose between the security of what he already had versus uh, the uncertainty of following the direction of the Lord. Uh, you know, I, I, I stand in a place where, where I'm secure with what I know I have because it's right here with me or I'm going to follow the uncertainty of the direction of the Lord. Uncertainty, that, that, that meaning, God, that has to deal with the hows of God, the uncertainty. Uncertainty meaning, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. And that's just part of our journey with the Lord. It's not knowing the hows of God. I, I know, God, you will deliver. I know you will bring me through. I know you will make a way. I know you will open a door. I just don't know how you're going to do it. And so I have to stand in that place where I need to choose between staying in a safe, secure place or when God says, let's go, I have to be able to trust the uncertainty of the direction of the Lord. Am I willing to leave what I know to follow who I know? That's what it comes down to. Am I willing to leave what I know in order to follow who I know? And that is the, the assignment of uncertainty. And that's an assignment you and I both will have to experience. Some of you right now, you're in the what I call the thing process. You're in the things process where he said, after these things, then God tested Abraham. You, you are in the things process, meaning that there are certain things God is doing or allowing in your life right now to prepare you for a test that he is going to administer to you. You're in the things process. Certain, certain events, certain incidences are going on right now for preparation for a test that God is going to give you because he will not give you the test until you and I 
have completed our assignment. You do not get the test until you what? Complete your assignment. And on our journey of maturity and our journey of faith with the Lord, there, there's an assignment called the worship assignment. And that's the assignment where we just don't sing songs. We live what we sing. There's the joy assignment. That assignment is where I'm going through with joy. I don't allow what I'm dealing with to crush me and to get me all messed up on the inside, but I go through with joy. There, there's the patience assignment where I learn to wait on the Lord and allow him to come through for me before I take matters in my own hands. There's the uncertainty assignment. There's the unknown assignment. Am I going to do like Paul, where Paul said, I go not knowing. All I know is that the Holy Spirit is with me. There are those assignments in our life that we have to what complete before God will administer the test. And so I encourage you in your assignment right now, finish that assignment. Finish that assignment. Complete that assignment so that God can give you the test that he desires to give you. And the purpose of the test is so that I can move to the next in God, the next uh, a place that God wants to bring me in to use our lives to touch other lives. So the plan of God is what? To bring you and I to Genesis 22 and 1. Yeah. God wants to bring us into that, that text where he's able to say, after these things, then Skylar trusted. After these things, then DeAndre trusted. After these things, then Jasmine trusted. After these things, then Candy trusted. After these things, then Tracy and April trusted. After these things, then Tracy Dunn trusted. After these things, then the Bugs trusted. The Callaways trusted. After these things, then my people trusted. That's what God wants to bring all of us to Genesis 22 and 1 to be able to say after these things, then they trusted me to give them a test. They trusted me. They were in a place of trust where I could test them, where I could test them. And that, that, that is where God, his desire and his plan is to bring us to that place. After these things, I was in a place where God tested me because he can trust me. Yeah. The test God has for us, the test that he wants to administer to us is the test called the fear of the Lord. That is the test. There are assignments that lead up to that test, but the test the Lord wants to administer to us is called the fear of the Lord. The outcome of this test, the fear of the Lord, will what? Number one, it will reveal who or what is number one in my life. The outcome of the test of the fear of the Lord will reveal who I love the most. Yeah. The outcome of this test, the fear of the Lord, will reveal who is most important to me. The outcome of the test of the fear of the Lord, it will reveal what God is able to do or not do through me. This test is critical. Yeah. This test is massive. This test is major because it's going to reveal who or what is number one in my life, who or what I love the most, who or what is most important to me, and it's going to reveal what God is able to do or not do through me. That's why this test is critical. The test called the fear of the Lord. And for Abraham, the overview of this test it went like this, as he spoke, as we read in the word, it went like this. The overview of the test said, now take the son I gave you, whose name is Isaac, that you have now, watch this, bonded with, that you have now invested time and attention with, um, that you have now established dreams with, that, that you have now raised up to be a nice, handsome young boy. I want you to take him, your what? Only son. And I want you to offer him as a burnt offering. That, that, that was the overview, the test overview. So 
It, it's like a teacher coming to class saying, class, here's an overview of the test. And for Abraham, the overview of the test was, on, he says these words, he says, now I want you, N-O-W, now take your son, Isaac, the son you have what? Established relationship with, you invested with, you have bonded with, I want you to take him now. And what I want you to do, I want you to offer him up as a burnt offering. Wow. What is he saying? The emphasis on the word now is that God waited until a relationship with Abraham and Isaac was developed before he asked him to go to the mountain and offer him up as a sacrifice. The word now, he says, now take your son. Now, now meaning after you have developed a relationship with him, after you have bonded with him, after now you both have a heart connection. Now, after now, uh, now meaning now that Isaac is able to understand uh, what's going on in his life from a physical, from a mental, from an emotional place. He says, now I want you to take him up. He, God could have asked Abraham to do this uh, the day he was born, maybe the week after when he was still a young, young baby and didn't have all the faculties of his mind for reasoning and understanding what's going on. But that, you know, he could have asked him early on before, uh, still would have been difficult, but before uh, a relationship was really bonding and built and conversations and, and dreaming and, and, and just enjoying one another before a strong heart connection happened. He, he could have asked him earlier, but God waited until this bond and this relationship had been built between Abraham and and it was a it was a very critical and crucial time that 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 word now when when God said Abraham now take your son, God God did this because God will never test you and I in an area that really has no meaning to us. He will never test you uh, with uh, any individual that has no meaning to you. He goes after that which we love in the test of the fear of the Lord. He goes after that which we bonded with. He goes after that which we have connected our hearts to. He goes after that which, which has the ability to turn me because I really, really love this particular individual or this particular thing. I really love it. And so God says, I'm done, I don't go after something that has no meaning to you. I go after something that has uh, a such meaning to you that you are bonded to it. It has the ability possibly to even turn you to not do what I want you to do or go in the direction I want you to go. That's what God tests you and I with. He goes after what? Your only, because that was his only son. And God told Abraham that I want you to offer up Isaac, your son. And then he said, your only son. God goes after your only he goes after your only. He goes after that which, if that, if that is gone from your life, you don't have nothing else. He goes after your only. If, if he takes that, that, that which, which is your only, then you don't, you don't have anything to replace it with. If he goes after your only, that means you're finished. You're done. It's, it's time to panic. God goes after, in the fear of the Lord test, he goes after your only. And then he says, I want you to offer him up as a burnt offering. A burnt offering was an offering where the entire offering, that which you were offering up, the entire offering was consumed. Yeah. It was completely sacrificed because they had many offerings throughout the Old Testament. And one of them was called the burnt offering. And then when God told him to offer him up as a burnt offering, Abraham understood and knew that meant to offer him up totally because there were some offerings where when they took a lamb or they took a goat or some other animal to where they did not have to burn the entire animal. They were able to keep parts, but God told Abraham, this is a burnt offering in this fear of the Lord test. That means you bring a, uh, Isaac and I want you to know that you are offering him up completely and totally to me. In other words, you offer him up to me, Abraham, and you walk away with nothing. 
You walk away with it. That is the burnt offering. I offer what God tells me, and I walk away with nothing. And that is the offering God looks for in every single one of our lives. That is the offering that he is requiring. He's requiring our all. He is requiring, requiring that burnt offering. It, it, it would be easy if, if, if we would have no problem with offering our all to the Lord if when we offered it to all to him at that same time, God will give me exactly uh, what I need right back at that time. You know, you walk in, you walk before the Lord, you offer, and then right there, he gives you back whatever you need. But that's not how it works with the Lord. When you and I go to him, God says, you offer and you walk away. You offer and you walk away. You don't offer and wait for something to come right then and there. You offer and you walk away. And then what does that do? And walking away, that requires me to trust him in a way that I've never trusted him before. It's me walking up to the Lord and saying, here, God, my heart, my mind, my life, my family, God, here, my career. You offer that up and you walk away and then you trust God for direction. You trust him for provision. That's what God is looking for. You bring it to me and then you walk away and trust me to supply for your life. And that's what he told Abraham. You offer your son as a burnt offering. Then the Bible says, after three days of journeying, Abraham sees the place that God told him to go. Just imagine that. Three days it took to leave from the house to get to Mount Moriah, where there were several hills and mountains in that area. It was not where God told him, now grab him and you get there in 20 minutes. Three days it took. Can you imagine the battle? Can you imagine the struggle? Can you imagine the mental anguish that Abraham dealt with for three days? Three days in this test of the fear of the Lord, Abraham has in his mind the contemplation of what he's doing, has in his mind, I am literally taking my son to kill him and just being obedient to what the Lord asked me to do. Three days he is thinking about this. Three days he had the opportunity to change his mind, to go in a different direction. Three days of feeling this emotionally, mentally. Three days this is going through the heart and the mind of Abraham as he is journeying to this mountain. And the Bible says after three days, when he saw the place that God told him to go, Abraham gets there and he leaves the two servants that he took with him. He leaves two servants and a donkey uh, behind. He leaves them and, and he takes, the Bible said, he took wood, he took a knife, and he took a fire along with Isaac. And he told the two men who, who, were, who, who he was leaving, his two servants, he tells them these exact words. He says, me and the lad, me and my son, me and Isaac are going up to worship, he says. We are going up to worship. We are going up to worship and we will be back. What, those were his exact words. We are going up to worship and we will be back. He did not say, I'm going to offer my son. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to put him on, uh, uh, on some wood as a sacrifice. And kill. That is not what Abraham said. He said that we are going to worship. Why did he use the term worship? Because worship demands a sacrifice. Worship demands a sacrifice. And that's why he used the term, we are going to worship. We're going to worship. And every worship experience, I love this. When he went to worship, he took what? He took wood, he took a knife, and he took fire on his way to worship. Because that's what you and I must bring into every worship experience. We must bring what? Wood, we must bring knife, and we must bring fire. What do we mean by wood, knife, and a fire? For us, the wood represents that which can burn, that which will burn. And so the wood is like a, a, a symbolic of our flesh, as even the Bible talks about in the New Testament, works that are wood, hay, and stubble will burn. The wood 
is uh, symbolic of our flesh. And so when I come to worship, I bring my flesh. When I come to worship, I bring a knife. And the knife represents the weapon of choice that I use to fight with. The weapon that I use to fight with is in that knife. And that knife is, is symbolic of the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so when I go into worship, I go to fight. And my weapon I fight with is the word. Because when we are singing, we don't just sing songs because we like them, because they have a good beat or a good little you know, hook to it. Our songs must be biblically based. Our songs must be founded upon the principles and the word of God so that when we sing, we are singing the word. We are fighting with the word. And so I bring my flesh and I bring that word which I'm going to use to destroy my flesh. And not only that, but I bring fire to worship. Fire represents my passion. It represents my energy. It represents my excitement. When we go to worship, don't come dead and, and, and don't come all, all sleepy and, and don't come half-hearted. When we come to worship, we come on fire. We come with passion. We come with excitement. We come ready to give God everything that I have. Why? Because worship is a war zone. Worship is a battlefield in itself. And when we go to worship, we go to sacrifice something. It is in worship where I attack my pride, where I attack jealousy, where I attack anger, where I attack bitterness, where I attack anything in my flesh that I don't want to rule and operate in my life any longer. That's what we do in worship. Something has to die. Something has to be laid before the Lord. It's not just singing songs. It is warfare. It is attacking something in my flesh. It is narrowing some area in my life that needs to disappear and be gone so that when I come out of worship, I'm more like him. I'm, I'm, I'm more like him mentally and emotionally. I'm more like him spiritually. That's what we do in worship. You bring your flesh, you bring your, your fight, and you bring your fire. When you and I go into worship, you bring your flesh, you bring your fight, and you bring your fire every single time. And we come out of worship with victory. And so when Abraham went up to the mountain. He told those two, two servants, he said, me and Isaac, we are going up to worship. And then he says this, and Abraham, he did not say that I'm coming back. Abraham said, and we will come back to you. I love that. I love that. Abraham said, we are going up to worship. And he said, and we, not I, will come back because he knew he was going to offer up his son. He said, no, we will come back. And he says this, but trust me, Abraham did not know what was going to happen up there on that mountain. Please believe me. Abraham did not know what he did. Abraham said, I'm just going to speak what I believe is what I'm going to do. I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to speak what I believe is going to happen, what I'm believing to happen when we get there on that mountain. And what I love about that is that you and I don't let what you don't know stop you from speaking what you believe. Don't, don't ever let what you don't know stop you from speaking what you believe. I don't know how you're going to work it out, God, but I believe you're going to work this out. I don't know how you're going to turn it around, but I believe you are going to turn it around. I don't know how you're going to heal this, God, but I believe you are going to heal this. I don't know how you're going to lift me out of this, God, but I believe you are going to lift me out of it. I don't know, but I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak what I believe. And at least if it don't happen, it's not because I didn't believe. It's not because I didn't trust them. If it don't happen, I, I'm going. I'm. Well, I'm like Hebrew. The Bible says in Hebrew, "I'm die. I'm going to die believing. I'm, I'm going to go through this all the way believing and trusting. If it don't happen, it won't be because I did not believe God. And if it does happen, it's because I totally believe God. So either way, I'm going in as a believer. I'm going through it as a believer, and I'm coming out as a believer. And that's what Abraham said. He told them, not I, but me and the lad, we will come back. And then at some point, as they were journeying up 
that mountain, they stopped. And, and when they stopped, uh, Isaac began to speak to Abraham. At some point, they stopped, and Isaac said this to his dad. I, Isaac said, I, I see the wood, and I see the fire. He said, but daddy, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Because again, we're not dealing with a two-year-old or a little baby. He has the mental capacity to understand what is going on here. And what he understood at this point was, we don't have a sacrifice. I see the wood and I see the fire, but dad, where is the sacrifice? This, this was included in the test that, uh, to, to give Abraham the, uh, the chance to turn around. This was included in the test to see if Abraham would turn back. It was included in the test to see if Abraham would look at his son and just decide, I can't do this. Because again, God is behind the scene and in control of everything. And he allows Isaac to ask Abraham this just to see if Abraham would go ahead and fold and go back down that mountain or go in another direction. Why? Because God will always include in every test that he gives you and I, he will always include uh, an opportunity or a door to see if we're going to turn back. Yes. In every test that God gives, that test will include something, something that's going to see if you will go in the opposite direction. Your test is going to include something to see if you're going to fold and if you're going to give in. What, what, will, what, will, what will try to turn you will come from what you have to sacrifice. What will try to turn you to go in another direction or to go back is what you have to sacrifice. In other words, your sacrifice is not going down without a fight. Your sacrifice is not just going to sit there and let you get rid of it. Your sacrifice is not, is not just going to be this easy thing that, oh, I'm going to give this up, and then it's just going to go away. No, your sacrifice and my sacrifice, they're not going down without a fight. Your sacrifice is not going down without trying to pull you back into a different direction. Your sacrifice is going to pull at your heart. It's going to pull at your emotion. Your sacrifice is going to try to get you to turn. It's going to do something or say something to try to get you to go away from the direction and the order and the instructions that God has given you. Your sacrifice is going to try to get you to think second thoughts about what you're doing. That's what your sacrifice sacrifice is going to do. But Abraham, he stood unmoved in his journey. And he responded to Isaac by saying, God will provide a lamb for the sacrifice. Abraham heard his son, felt his son, but stood unmoved in his journey, not unchallenged, unmoved. There's a difference between being unchallenged and unmoved. Abraham was challenged to the highest degree because he loved his only son. And when his son stopped, and I'm sure he had that look in his eyes, and I'm sure that, that everything that was built in their relationship at that time was risen to its highest level inside Abraham. Abraham was challenged but unmoved. And that's where you and I have to get. We have to get to a place where I'm challenged but unmoved. I'm challenged in my faith but I'm not moving. I'm challenged in my heart and in my mind, but I'm not moving. I am challenged in my spirit, but I'm not moving. I'm challenged by the enemy, but I am not moving. I am challenged by the season of what we are going through, but I am not moving. You got to be able to be challenged yet unmoved. And that's where Abraham was. He told his son that God will provide a lamb for the sacrifice. And when they got to the spot where this sacrifice was to take place, the Bible says that they arrived there. And what, what did Abraham do? Abraham built an altar. He built an altar. The purpose of the altar, as it was in the Old Testament, they built altars. The purpose of the altar was to take the offering from the profane to the sacred. 
is what would happen when they would have an animal and they were getting ready to sacrifice it and they would build an altar. And once they put that animal up on the altar, it took that animal from just being something normal or just an animal or, or, or just uh, something that I'm giving to the Lord. It took it from just something and to being something sacred unto the Lord. That's why they would build altars putting it on the altar would transform it into just something normal, into something sacred. And that's why he built that altar. He, he built an altar there and in building the altar, that the, he understood the purpose of the altar. Look, it was to say that this is a sacred moment because all worship should be a sacred moment. Uh, Abraham knew, so the purpose of me building this altar, this is a sacred moment, and what we're doing is not normal. This is a sacred act before God. And, 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 and that was the purpose of the altar. Building the altar represented how serious this was that we are about to do. It represented the seriousness of the relationship between God and Abraham, the building of the altar, the building of the altar, the architect of the altar, how this was to be built. That represented the seriousness between the relationship of God and Abraham, because you didn't just slap something together. No, to build it was to take your time and to put this together in a way that would be excellent and right and in order before the Lord. Building of the altar represents the seriousness of the relationship between God and Abraham. And hear this, P4W family and our guests, this hour and this time, God is saying, I want you to take your relationship with me very, very serious. Amen. That's why we're building. That's why we use the language, let's build and let's train, because God is saying, you have to take your relationship with me very, very serious. Serious meaning of utmost importance. Serious meaning being thoughtful. Serious meaning urgent and weighty. Serious, it, it means this is no joke. Serious meaning this is pressing. My relationship with God is not something light. It is not something jokingly. It is not some normal thing that, that I have. No, my relationship with God is very serious. And that's what God is looking for from every single one of us. God is saying, I need you to take your relationship with me very, very serious. When you put a relationship you have with God behind a relationship with somebody else, that means your relationship with God is not serious. When you put God behind someone or something else, that means your relationship with God is not serious. If you can go two or three or four consecutive days with no prayer, with no worship, without reading the word, you are not taking your relationship with God serious. If when you, if, if you don't attempt to apply the word of God to when you get angry and when you are tempted, if you don't attempt to apply the word of God when you've been broken and hurt by the actions of someone else, you don't attempt to even try to apply the word of God to that situation, then you are not taking your relationship with God serious. Because when your relationship with God is serious, you fight to obey God. You fight to worship him no matter what. You fight to give him praise. You fight to serve. You fight to fellowship. You fight laziness. You fight every excuse that can be there. Why? My relationship with God is at its serious height, and I take him serious. Therefore, I make sure I fight to keep him first and foremost in my life. And that's what he is doing in building the altar. He, it means when they would build it, it represented how serious their relationship with God was. And the Bible says that there they are now in this place. Abraham has built the altar. And it said that he bound his son Isaac upon the altar. Now, what it did not say when he carried up the items he carried up to the sacrifice, Abraham, the Bible mentioned wood, as we talked about. It mentioned a knife and it mentioned a fire. It didn't, I didn't read there a rope, but it says he bound Isaac to the wood. 
for the sacrifice. In other words, if he didn't have a rope, that means with one hand, he is holding him down. And you have to bind him because Isaac is not just laying there saying, Daddy, go ahead and kill me. This is a young boy looking at his dad with a knife in his hand. In his mind, what is going on? He is trying to move. He is trying to get up. He is not just willingly laying there to be killed. That's why it says he bound him. He held him. He pressed down with one hand and another hand. He had his knife and he's getting ready to come down with the knife on his son. And the Bible says the angel of the Lord spoke from heaven. A word from heaven came and he said, Abraham, Abraham, do not touch the lad. Don't lay one hand upon him. Don't do anything to him. And then here comes the word. He says, for I now know that you fear God yes. because you have not withheld your only son from me. I, he didn't say, I know you fear God because you're scared and you have, and, and, and you're shivering down there. No, that's not the fear of the Lord. That's the spirit of fear. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, the fear of the Lord. Now I know you fear the Lord. Why? Cause you did not withhold your only son from me. You did not do it. Don't, don't touch him. Don't kill him. I, I know that you fear me now. I know it. I know it. What is, what is he saying? When he says, I know you fear the Lord. In other words, the fear of the Lord, it means there's nothing or no one in this life you regard higher than the Lord. Yes. The fear of the Lord, there's nothing or no one you revere more in this life than the Lord. There's nothing that you respect or honor more in this life than the Lord. That's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord means there is nobody on this earth that can take God's place in your life. Nobody, nothing in this life, in on this world, on this earth that can take God's place in your heart. That is the fear of the Lord. Why do we know this? And why did God know this? Because if there was anything or anyone that could take God's place, he was right there. And that was his son, Isaac, whom he loved and whom he had prayed for. And that's why the one person that could have took God's place was right there before Abraham. Abraham was willing and Abraham did sacrifice Isaac there on that mountain. He sacrificed him from the very day that the Lord told him to take your son. He had sacrificed him on that three day journey that they walked up to the mountain, the place where he was going to sacrifice him. God said, I, I know there's nobody can take my place because if there could be, and if there was, that was the person right there. In other words, you did sacrifice him. But Abraham did not sacrifice him externally. He sacrificed him internally. And that's where God is looking for the sacrifice. God's focus is not on the external. His focus is on the internal. Because you can give up something externally without giving it up in your heart internally. That's why God focuses on what is happening on the inside of us. You know how we can say, I forgive somebody, and we say that externally, but internally, we know we still can't stand them. We say, I forgive, but internally, when we see that person's stuff begins to rise up on the inside, and, and we get all that ugly stuff happening in our heart, or, or we talk about, I'm over it, but yet you still talk about it every month and every week, and it happened two years ago, and you say, I'm over it, but yet you still bring it up. Why? Because internally, that thing is still alive. You may, have, you may have said it externally, but internally it is still alive. Here's what I see in this. You can kill Isaac on the outside, but keep him alive on the inside. And that's what you and I do not want to do. You can kill it on the outside but keep him alive on the inside. Keep him alive in your heart. Keep him alive in your heart means you're living in the past by keeping this person present with you every day. 
that that's what you do on the inside you 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 live you keep them alive in your heart meaning that i'm keeping them present in my life on a daily basis and internally you can keep that person number one externally you'll say oh it's over and it's gone but if you don't kill that thing on the inside internally that person is still number one and not god on the inside that object that person becomes the object of your anger against god uh, on the inside, it becomes the object of your depression. It becomes the object of why you refuse to give your all to God because I just, just because I said I kill it doesn't mean I killed it. You got to get rid of that thing on the inside. You kill it within, and then it will be killed from without. Yes. The fear of the Lord, meaning Abraham, you did not know what was going to happen on that mountain, but you trusted me. And can't you hear God? calling that from each and every one of us. I don't know what's going to happen, but God, I trust you. Yeah. I trust you. I trust you. That, that's what God wants. He wants that from every single one of us. God, he wants that, that fear of the Lord that says, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen, but I trust you. I, tr I, have no I have nothing else but to trust you, God. I trust you, not knowing what is going to happen. I trust you. And when the angel of the Lord said, now I know that you fear God. When he, when he speaks that to Abraham, when I, now that I know, I know that you fear God, the real person that found out where he stood was Abraham because God is all-knowing. He knows everything. He already, he already knew the heart, the condition, but what he wanted to do was show Abraham where he stood with him. God wants me to know, and he wants you to know, what, what am I willing to give up to him and what I, and what am I not willing to give up? And that's why he will bring you and I to that place, that test, the fear of the Lord. Because God said, I want you to know what you're willing to give up and what you're not willing to give. I want it on the table. I want it out. I want you and I to know together. I don't want to think you hiding something from me. God said, I want this plain to see. That's why we have to go through this test because I want you to know. Now, Abraham, now you know. Now you know there ain't nothing you will keep back from me. God wants you and I to know what we're willing to give up and what we're not. God tested Abraham in such a way as he did. And it was a challenging test because on our journey with God and where he wants to bring us and what he has planned for us, God has to know that there's no trace of unwillingness in me to do your will. He has to know that there, there's no hesitation. There's no second thoughts in my mind to do your will. Family, that's where we are. That's how serious this is. God said, I want to know your heart. And I want, really, I want you to know where you stand with me. I want you to know where you are with me so that you can make a mature decision. Are you coming with me all the way or not? And then Genesis 22 and 16, we read it. It said, because you have done these things, blessings, I'll bless you. Multiply. What, what happens when you and I fear the Lord? God said, I'm going to bless you like crazy. I'm going to multiply you. You, you, you. you possess the areas of your enemies. That, that's what will happen when you fear me. God is saying, when you pass that test, get ready because it's coming. And then last, I want us to, to, to look at some areas in our life that, that I want us to engage in this week. And I want us to think about uh, uh, these challenges. This is, this is this what, I, what I want you and I to walk away from this week in, 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 in this message, in this lesson, in this word that God gave us. Questions to ask yourself this morning. Number one, is there any area in my life that I don't trust God with? that I will block his hand from touching. Want you, want you and I to ask ourselves this morning, what is it that I don't want God to ask for from me? Because I know I will not give it to him if he asks. And that's just being honest. What is it that I do not want God to come for? Lord, because I know I won't give it to you. We got to wrestle with that. We got to deal with that, and we got to deal with that right now. Then I want us to, to look at what is in my life 
what is in my life. I want us to look at what is in my life. That if God took it from me, I would struggle to serve him. I want us to look at that. What is, what is in my life that if God took this from me, I struggle to really serve him. I want us to look at what is it in my life if God allows this to happen, I will turn from him or it would alter my relationship with him. If God allows this to happen in my life, in my family, in my spouse, in my children, in my career, if God allowed this to happen, whatever this is, if he allowed this to happen, I would, I would turn from him or it would alter my relationship, just would not be the same. What is it in my life that if God does not allow this to happen, I'll struggle to believe. If he doesn't allow this to come through, if he doesn't allow me to experience this, if this does not, I'm gonna struggle to really believe him. I want us to deal with those areas and I want us to deal with them now. Our continual prayer must be, God, highlight that area, that person, that activity in my life that I struggle to internally sacrifice to you. We can do the external thing, but remember, just because you kill Isaac on the outside don't mean that you killed him on the inside. God, highlight that area. Highlight that person. Highlight that situation, that individual, God. Bring it to light before me that, that I struggle to internally sacrifice to you. Because, Lord, I have to get to a place where, where there is no trace of unwillingness in me, no, no trace of anything in me, God, that would withhold from you what you are after in my life. God help us, Jesus. I pray that, Lord, we will receive this word. We'll deal with it. We'll talk about it. We'll wrestle with it. We'll process it. I pray that someone will go back and listen to it again to hear your voice, God, and your direct intention to us right where we are, that we will pass the test of the fear of the Lord. God, I pray that we will get to Genesis 22, 1 in our life, having completed assignments, get to that place where, God, you can test us. You can trust us with a test. And I pray that we will hear just as Abraham heard. For now I know that you fear me because you didn't withhold anything from me. I know and you know who's number one in your life, who you love the most. I know what I can do with you now, and you know what I can do with you because you did not withhold that which you love from me. God, I pray that you will speak loud and clear in our ears and in our hearts. Holy Spirit, do surgery in us. Do a work in us because we have to walk in the fear of the Lord. We have to walk. We have to live in that place. What blessings, what multiplying that, that is out there that hasn't happened yet for us because, God, I have not yet put you number one and, and revered you as the highest in my life. What blessings am I missing? What what multiplication and increase has not come into my life yet that's waiting for me to walk in the fear of the Lord. That's waiting for me, God, to allow you access in every area of my life and everything and everyone I'm connected to, to totally yield that to you. God, I pray that we, your church, would yield and would walk in the fear of the Lord so that we can operate at the highest capacity of effectiveness every day of our life. We honor you. And we bless you. And I pray for those who may be listening who don't have a relationship with you. 
that's you. God has already forgiven you. Just accept his forgiveness. Ask the Lord into your life and you will be in a relationship with him.